are wanting to engage in a conversation around anti-Asian violence uh, based on what we've seen in our communities and what we witnessed over the past year or so. And we know that this phenomenon is not new. In fact, it dates back from when the first Chinese worker set foot on this land in the 1800s. Um, but this is, you know, this history is nothing but a short paragraph or a footnote in our history books. You know, we maybe learned about the Chinese Exclusion Act, but what did that really mean? And I'm meeting a lot of newly politicized Asian Americans who want to know, like, what they can do to protect our communities and how do we fight back? Um, in my opinion, the very first step is knowing our history. The second step is analyzing that history in the context of the great capitalist nation of the United States. And of course, imperialist domination, um, you know, imperialism meaning um, global expansion. Um, and these two fundamental steps really help us inform how exactly do we fight back? And I know Rachel will be talking about this at length. Um, I'm like super hyped because I recently just finished the Exterminate All the Brutes documentary series on HBO, which I don't know if people have seen it, but it's just, you should watch it. I mean, it just, it makes me really angry, but it makes me like determined to fight back all the time. So um, anyways, where do we begin? Um, let's go to the next slide. So I don't think that we can understand racism against Chinese people without contextualizing why Chinese people had to immigrate in droves to the US in the first place and to the, into the West. So in the 1800s, uh, the Qing government in China was in deep decline where everyday people were facing heavy taxes, food shortages, extreme weather catastrophes, exploitation and civil unrest. And at the same time, the British wanted China to continue buying opium, um, which China was one of it, uh, Britain's biggest markets. The issue is that the population in China was highly addicted to opium. Um, so when the Chinese government refused, the British forced open China by waging all out war against China. And this is 1842. And if people don't know, this is called the Opium War of 1842, which, which broke open China for imperialist subjugation. And I just wanted to survey people in the chat. Um, how many people know what happened when, when uh, China lost the Opium War? I'll give folks a few minutes to type. Hong Kong, colonies, yep, exactly. Colonization, Hong Kong, yes. That's exactly um, the point I wanted to make here. You know, I think that, um, not to get into it now, but I think like when we think about Hong Kong, we have to think about the legacy of where the opium wars and how Hong Kong became a colony of Britain as a result of this like brutality that was waged against China. Um, and yeah, China was opened up, it became a semi colony, which meant it was open season for every major expansionist imperialist nation um, to exploit, loot, and as a consequence, underdevelop China. And this marked the beginning of what is called the century of humiliation in China. So the instability within China, coupled with the looting of China, forced people, no other choice but to migrate for better opportunities. Um, and then there's the coolie trade um, that takes place. Just quickly, I want to I want to know if people know what this term coolie means. Um, and you could type it in the chat if you if you know what it means. Nope. All right, great history lesson. Um, okay, so coolie refers to cheap Asian migrant workers, which began as early as the 17th century, but in the 1800s, the coolie trade, which was you know ships packed with primarily Chinese laborers, were a direct response to the end of slavery. And this meant that cheap Chinese labor was shipped not only to the US, but to Cuba, to Central and South America to replace African slaves. And in fact, while many of the laborers landed in the Pacific Northwest, some were sent to the South during reconstruction to replace black labor. So we can trace back this deliberate division between black and Asians back to the 1800s, all in the name of which is most profitable, if not black slaves, then Chinese labor. And who remembers in their history lesson 
about the, the manifest destiny. Also type in the chat, okay. Right, so um, the manifest destiny, if, if folks don't remember, it was a doctrine of the 1800s that justified the further expansion of American settle, uh, settlements to the West, right? This westward expansion, which aided the continual genocide of native tribes in the US. And when the first wave of Chinese immigrants came to the US in the 1850s to California during the gold rush, this meant the total extermination of, of, of native tribes in California. And so here, um, here I have these Chinese characters, which in Cantonese is called gumsan, uh, which translates to Golden Mountain or Gold Mountain, which was a nickname used by Chinese people to describe North America because of the gold rush. But now it's more commonly known as San Francisco. And this symbolized the so-called American dream. But as we will see, the life of the average Chinese worker in the US, especially at this time, was one of exploitation, of brutality, of violence, of discrimination and humiliation. So uh, next slide. Okay, so why racism? Well, one of the most profitable tools out there is division in the form of racism against, especially as we're talking now of Asian people and of Chinese people. And in order to exploit workers, you have to brutalize them so that they don't fight back. You have to weaponize hatred of other groups, pit different groups of workers against each other so that it drives down the cost of labor. And remember this, right? Racism is a tool for profit. And the more we think about racism in this way, the more we understand like how to analyze not just the racism against Asian people, but of, of natives, of black people, of uh, Latino people, of immigrants. And so this weaponization of racism led to violent rampages carried out by white mobs across the US where Chinese people were routinely massacred, were beaten and driven out. And so I just wanted to highlight a few examples here. So Los Angeles massacre of 1871, this was considered one of the worst mass lynchings in the United States where 500 mostly white people entered Chinatown of Los Angeles, looted and burned down Chinatown where 18 to 19 men were killed, one of whom was a teenage boy, and 15 were hanged. And then, of course, we have the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, where restrictions against Chinese immigration into the US, which emboldened white mobs to continue to beat and harass Chinese people. Um, we have here the Tacoma method, where in Tacoma, Washington, uh, 500 residents marched through Chinatown, forced residents to pack their bags and leave. And they were, they were basically herded like cattle during extreme weather storms. And Chinatowns were once again looted, burned to the ground. And the, major, uh, the, the, the mayor of the city was celebrated actually as a hero and that this method of driving out Chinese people would be replicated in other areas of the country. And then, uh, you know, this is not the last of the brutality that we face, but just the last one that I'll highlight is the Snake River Massacre of 1887, which happened in Oregon, where 34 Chinese miners were robbed, killed, and mutilated. And just to kind of demonstrate the level of dehumanization that Chinese people face, uh, the killers kept body parts of the deceased as souvenirs. Um, of, of their conquest. And this is, a this is like a racist tool that's used for colonization all around the world. Yeah, I mean, I wanna just jump in real quick, Sheila, and add like in historically in the South, um, African-American people, a big part of lynchings that happened, um, you know, with white supremacist mobs, they would not only just cut off body parts, but they would cut off the genitalia of black people in America and keep them in jars. Like I actually had a professor once who was a very interesting guy, but he told me about, um, he, had met a, he had met somebody years ago in the South who still had some of these jars because it's not that long ago that this happened 
happened um, that is was passed on from his father. So I think it's really important that we just kind of add that aspect in, you know, like this is what, like the brutality of this racist system is just, I mean, God, like it's really hard to encapsulate, but it also wasn't that long ago. Um, it really wasn't like thousands of years ago. This is This is very recent history. Yes, exactly. Thank you. And I mean, there's so, there's just so much um, brutality and this this type of brutality is synonymous to what uh, the American settlers did to native people as well. Just it's just, you know, I think like we have to like the tool, the, the tools of warfare and racism um, are the same tools used across all different uh, sectors of our communities. Um, Anyways, okay, so let's go to the next slide. So um, I wanted to talk about resistance a little bit, and I know that Rachel's going to go into this a lot more, but I just wanted to highlight this point because um, I think there's an inherent connection between the struggle that we have here in the United States and, of course, uh, of during this time in the 1800s, but also the resistance um, abroad of what it meant to Chinese people um, in China when they see that Chinese people are being brutalized here. Um, and so, yeah, while we were fighting against exclusion in the US, our Chinese brothers and sisters were fighting for uh, fighting against exclusion at, in, in China. Uh, there was a large scale boycott of American goods that was launched in 1905 in response to the furthering of the uh, Exclusion Act, where workers not only quit working for American companies, but they boycotted all goods. Um, something like 90% of businesses in, in Shanghai displayed placards supporting this boycott, which gained immense support throughout Asia and was extremely effective, so much so that standard oil sales plummeted from 900,000 cases of fuel per month to 19,000. Um, so just wanted to kind of throw that in there that like, yes, the Chinese Exclusion Act happened, but like there was resistance on all fronts. Next slide, please. Um, here, I just wanted to highlight some posters, um, very obviously racist posters um, against Chinese people and Asian people that were deemed an existential danger to the world and that we were a menace. Um, next slide, please. And here, you know, um, hitting a little bit closer to home where we're characterized as immoral, as evil, as degenerate, as dirty, as people who inherently carry diseases. And the next slide. I was gonna say real quick on this rats poster, cause I found this thing and I was like, you know, like it's really not that different. Like it's really not that different from all of the kind of propaganda we saw earlier during COVID about Chinese people eating bats. It really isn't. Like if you look at the images, it's like kind of disturbing, not kind of, it's quite disturbing to see how easily the, the propaganda of the old remains still in circulation today, but with a modern twist. Can I add something real quick on the, sorry, the comic on that right side, it's actually a French cartoon um, that uh, shows the uh, European powers and Japan at the very right side, um, splitting up China like a cake or a pizza or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for pointing that out. I mean, that's the, you know, same thing with the Middle East, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, same thing in Africa, just carving up entire continents for profit, for looting. Um, so uh, Rachel beat me to the punch, but the next slide um, very much echoes the sentiment that, that she just pointed out, right? Like these headlines and images of China very much echoing the same type of racism that was used against us before. And we have to understand how the demonization of China is reigniting this racist legacy against Asians here in the US that has always been here. Um, you know, the, that China is the real sick man of Asia is not different from, from the posters that we saw from decades, centuries ago. Um, okay, so next slide, please. And, you know, and because we're coming off of the heels of the Atlanta shootings where Asian women were very explicitly targeted, it is important that we talk about 
the 1875 Page Act, which was a racist and sexist exclusionary policy that actually preceded the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Um, and we don't really hear about this um, or talk about this, right? Um, and I just wanted to connect this to the current day struggle against uh, you know, backwards immigration policies, right? In contemporary immigration discourse, we're familiar with the term of family separation as a phenomenon that the US government is engaging in. And as we speak, thousands of immigrants are at the border waiting to be reunified with their loved ones, kept in horrible, horrible conditions. And Biden has done nothing and, and in, in fact, probably made it worse. Um, and this tool of imperialism is not new and has been used before. And so I just wanted to connect that back to the Page Act because the Page Act prohibited the immigration of Chinese, Japanese, and East Asian women because they posed a threat to the institution of marriage, right? Because they were uh, seen as, um, there's a stigma around Asian women as being prostitutes, as being immoral, all these things, right? And many of these women, what were they doing? They were seeking to immigrate, to reunite with their husbands, right? Um, who they had been separated from for years with no certainty of unity. They were immigrating to flee instability and starvation. And in fact, my great grandfather um, immigrated to Peru to find work. He was a migrant worker and was never able to go back to China. So that's like a very real phenomenon of family separation caused by imperialist war. Um, at the same time, the US government and all of its wars abroad require very explicit dehumanizing training of US soldiers, right? US soldiers are taught to dehumanize women of the nations that they were colonizing, right? There's Korea, there's the Philippines, there's a, uh, Vietnam. And then later on, these same tactics were used when we were uh, trying to terrorize the Middle East. Um, I did an interview recently for the magazine Breaking the Chains with um, longtime activist Joyce Chediak, where she inter where she actually talks about interviewing GI soldiers from the Vietnam War and how they were actually taught systematically to dehumanize and think about Vietnamese women in preparation for war. So um, you know all of this to say that the dehumanization of women of Asian people is used to justify the horror of warfare. And in the time of war and colonization, some of the only industries for these women when their country's being occupied were the industries of sex work, which were created for the pleasure of soldiers, exclusively made up of Asian women. So there is no separating the global phenomenon to the domestic phenomenon when we're thinking about the hypersexualization of Asian women. And the reason why Asian women face misogynistic harassment on a daily basis is because of this legacy of utilizing sexism and racism as a tool for expansion and for profit. So, um, Next slide, unless others want to comment on it. All right, cool. Next slide. Um, OK, so maybe we could take a volunteer to just read this out. Um, very much captures all that we talked about. Let's see. Me, somebody in the chat, you can just say me, and un or unmute, and just start reading. OK, Bao. Let's have Bao read this out loud. They are, for the most part, an industrious people, forbearing and patient of injury, quiet and peaceful, uh, peaceable in their habits. Say this, and you have said all good that can be said of them. They are uncivilized, sorry, my cat's meowing here, unclean and filthy beyond all conception without any of the higher domestic or social relations. Lustful and sensual in their dispositions, every female is a prostitute of the basest order. The first words of English that they learn are terms of obscenity or profanity, and beyond this, they care to learn no more. Um, New York Daily Tribune, uh, Chinese Immigration to California, 29 September 1854. Thank you so much, Bao. Yeah, so this very much just captures a lot of, summarizes everything that I've just gone through to this point. Um, next slide. So um, just very quickly, because there's just too many examples of exclusion against Asians. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time talking about Chinese exclusion, but, um, but you know, this has been waged against all, all Asian people. Um, but here we have the 1906 San Francisco Board of Education, where it was decided that Japanese students, uh, Japanese people were expected to be um, 
basically educated in segregated schools from everyone else. Um, and then here we have the Immigration Act of 1917, where um, people of Asiatic nations were excluded from immigrating here. That included South Asians, specifically, um, you know, formerly Burma, uh, Afghanistan, India, and other nations. Um, in 1924, uh, People probably remember Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal, um, which was used to rule against these two sisters, these Chinese sisters who were trying to enter um, a white school. And then the Asian Exclu Asiatic Exclusion Leagues, which were organizations formed in the early 1900s to, uh, to basically uh, demand for the exclusion of Koreans, Japanese, and, and Chinese people from immigrating. And the list really just goes on. Um, but in the next slide, I wanted to highlight something that I actually just recently learned about. Um, let's go to the next slide, which was the anti-Filipino Watsonville riots of the 1930s, which, um, you know, Watsonville is a small town here in California where basically uh, there was a, a dance hall that was recently opened in this town and a Filipino man, Filipino farm worker was seen dancing with a white woman. And this set off uh, like these riots that were basically led by white mobs, went into Filipino communities, specifically targeting Filipino workers, farm workers. Um, and this, this not only sparked riots in Watsonville, California, but all across Northern California. And this led to the restriction of Filipino immigrants, um, the Tiding, Tidings McDuffie Act, which restricted, I think it was like the quota was like 50 Filipino people per year. And it wasn't until under the Obama administration that they formally apologized for this exclusion. Um, so yeah, just wanted to point that one out. Um, and then can we go to the next slide? And then of course, the 1942 Executive Order 9066, AKA the Japanese internment. Um, you know, we all know about the horrors of this. You know, I think this is, a, if there's anything that we learned in our history books, it's probably this one, um, where World War II, Japan bombs Pearl Harbor and Franklin Roosevelt declares this executive order, which was otherwise known as a relocation of Japanese people, no matter their nativity status, no matter where they were born, um, the excuse here was that, that they were preventing espionage, right? And to protect persons of Japanese descent from harm at the hands of Americans who had strong anti-Japanese attitudes during World War II and after the attacks of Pearl Harbor. I mean, this is just insane that this is like the rationale used for the internment of Japanese people. And the irony of these statements are just astounding and bigoted, right? For one, about two thirds of those in turn were citizens, US citizens. And that's not really even the point here, right? The racist rhetoric and the blanket stereotypes served the purpose of US imperialist war agenda, uh, leading to the internment of over 100,000 Japanese people. And then to claim that this was done for the safety of Japanese people, um, it's just crazy. Uh, and we all know too well that like racism has always been orchestrated um, by our government for their own agenda for profits. And in this case, anti-Japanese rhetoric only helped justify the US military efforts in fighting their imperialist competitors in World War II. And so when we think about the surge of anti-Asian violence today, I've, I've heard many people say things like, let's not make this political, which usually means let's not talk about the US-China issue. It's too complicated, it's too sensitive. But when, we, when you know about this history and you know about how this was used to intern thousands of people, innocent people, um, how can you not draw the connection, the very apparent connection of the bashing of Asian people at home today to the China bashing, bashing that is manufactured by the US government and corporate media? You know, I, you know, I think like, I, I understand that people wanna sidestep the issue, but like, in order to fight it, we have to draw these connections. And then next slide, please. And then here we have the 1980s anti-Japanese trade war between the US and Japan 
um, which really was set off by the fact that Japanese auto industry was overtaking the American auto industry. And this created, once again, a lot of animosity among the white working class here in the US. And there was a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment um, where people were taking sledgehammers to Japanese manufactured cars, where I don't know if people know this, but I just recently learned this, but the term rice rocket was like a hugely um, denigrating term to describe Japanese cars. Um, it's just, it was interesting because I grew up around Chinese boys that loved <laughs> car, souping up their cars. So that, that was interesting for me to learn. <laughs> I mean, that's like the term, the ricers, you know what I mean? Like, I don't yeah. know, where I grew up, we had all the, oh my God, it was a lot. <laughs> yeah. My boyfriend was one of those, ex-boyfriend, oh high school boyfriend. Um, anyways, okay, so not to get off track, but this this was a very serious situation where there was a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment. But who was, the, who was the collateral damage, right? I think Vincent Chin is a very... Um, symbolic example of anti-Japanese and as a consequence, anti-Asian racism. Vincent Chin was a Chinese man, very young. And on the night of uh, the eve of his wedding was beaten up by two, uh, two white men at a bar, um, taking out their, their issues around this economic issue on this, this man. And this is, this is really the legacy of weaponizing racism in this way. Yeah, Sheila, if I could jump in quickly um, for the last slide too with Japanese internment, I just I just want to like drive just to point home. Like my um, you know, my my partner Alex, actually, he's also a facilitator, he's my husband. Um, but our in-laws are like fifth generation Japanese. And I think it's like, you know, I've sat at dinner tables, I've talked with people, you know, like one of his uncles who literally was interned, like he was, he was interned and he talks about the experience. I mean, they put people in horse stalls. Like what they did was they came in the middle of the night and they told you to get out of your house and you took a trash bag and you took all your stuff and you threw it in the trash bag and then you took it out and then that was it. And that you didn't see your home for years. And that was it. Usually white people moved into your homes and took it. That's usually what happened. So there are still like the legacy. If you go in the Pacific Northwest, which is where a lot of his family is from, like, you know, like Oregon, Washington area, that's where the Japanese cherry farmers were. There's a lot of land that you could just like find that was just farms that were taken, just straight up taken by white people when Japanese people were interned. And I think that there's another little quick point I want to make to what you were saying, Sheila. In 2001, there was also an incident. It's called the Chinese spy plane incident or the Hainan Island incident, which was really, I, I just want to bring it to attention because the idea that internment let one was a long time ago is a lie. Like we have family members who were who talk about it, they're alive. Like, it's just, it's not that long ago that this happened in America. One and two, with this incident that I was talking about, the Chinese spy plane incident, in 2001, there was like a mass conservative debate over whether or not Chinese internment was really a problem, the idea of moving to Chinese internment. And this was before the Asia pivot in 2008, when Obama, um, you know, started moving in the direction of really like putting military, you know, focus on Asia. But I just want to say, like, we should be very aware of the legacy of an internment, that it's not going to be gone and that the rationale for it will always continue to exist. And it's still in many places and by many people, like, like folks really just say, well, it was completely justified and understandable. And so that logic can come back. And it did come back in a pretty big hot button topic in 2001. And it could easily come back today. I mean, in some ways it already has, right? Like so many Chinese international students are being targeted by their institutions for espionage. You know, I met a Chinese international student from UC Irvine at one of our demonstrations. And he said like the level of racism he faces is like, he, he will literally go into office hours and like be ignored by the professor. And like students would walk in and, 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 the, and these professors would talk to these students, but ignore him. You know, I think like, yeah, like the thing is like, you know, when hatred is weaponized, it doesn't matter. It like just doesn't matter whether you're, Japanese, Korean, Filipino, or Chinese, right? Like it's it's the fact that you look a certain way and that you represent this hatred that has been weaponized by our country. And so when our government launches a racist campaign a, a, about a certain country, it, it is inevitable that those who are targeted are the people who look like those from that country, right? So we we here at home become the collateral damage. And I think like that's the point that I wanted to drive in. and. <clears throat> 
also on the point of Japanese internment, like um, I had a coworker who's, who's, uh, whose family was interned and she told me like, if you had a young infant child, your two hands meant that one hand held your baby and the other hand held your belongings. So it's just, that's all you could take. And this is, this, this is very real. Um, so I'm just about to wrap up my section here, but let's go to the uh, next slide. I think the slide after, that. yeah, that one. So I wanted to talk, I wanted to end here because I think this is the plight of what we're dealing with um, in the Asian American community. Um, and knowing this history and the sudden emergence of the model minority myth is really not a coincidence, right? It is a tool that is used to divide our struggles, to erase our struggles and to maintain a certain type of status quo of passivity. And these are just some of the examples of racist violence against our communities, right? We could, we could write many volumes of, of, of books just on the violence that Asian communities have faced over the course of US history. You know, we were exploited workers, we were demonized as a group of people. Racism has been whipped up to justify our extremely low wages, keep us from fighting back against the racist system. And when we think about low wage immigrant workers today, the brutality that they face and the threat of deportation is very similar. And this is why um, it's important for us to unite our struggles, right? And knowing this history as an Asian American, um, nothing is more infuri infuriating than the model minority stereotype to know what brutality we've been put through and then to be told, oh, but you're like the, you're like the favorite minority group of America. No, like, I reject that 100%. And I think as people who wanna fight in the struggle need to reject that as well, right? You know, like where was the model minority when our communities were repeatedly driven out, right? When, when Japanese people were being interned, right? We're not just simply hard workers who make no noise, right? This completely erases the violent past of repeated racism against every oppressed community. And it erases the fact that Asian Americans uh, work terribly backbreaking jobs, low wage jobs. Asian women, in fact, massively devastated um, by this pandemic because what work do we take on? We take retail work, service work, you know, um, domestic work. Um, you know, and, and a lot of Asian Americans who are, or Asian immigrants who are undocumented, who live in tiny apartments, who struggle to pay for rent, right? Asians that make up some of the most impoverished groups in New York City um, and in San Francisco. Um, you know, even here in LA, like ch our, our Chinese residents in Chinatown are repeatedly intimidated by greedy landlords facing eviction. So these are the sh real struggles that we face and then to be told, but you are the model minority um, is really an attempt to pacify us, to, to get us to not fight back, to see us as separate from our brothers and sisters from other uh, ethnic groups. So um, I'm just gonna end there. I know that I talked a lot, um, but yeah, thank you all so much. We'll do that. All right, if you scroll down, it's the one that David um, Monkawa, yeah. Okay. We'll pause it for a sec and then back it up. All right, so I wanted to just share this video, um, just of this, a very brief thing. We were talking a lot about internment, especially in our group, we were really like getting into the topic. And I wanted to share that it's super important that like there was not just, people were not just interned without resistance. Like there was a very active resistance movement and afterwards a very, very robust movement for reparations as well for Japanese Americans. So let's listen to this clip. In the period leading up to that whole period, California Big Agriculture, their bankers like Wells Fargo and Bank of America, they allied with white supremacists and they wanted to lobby Roosevelt, lock up the jabs, lock up the jabs. We want to take their farmland, 640,000 acres of valuable farmland, all their assets, make up an excuse. They're terrorists, they're saboteurs. So after Pearl Harbor happened, Roosevelt locked up everybody. And in the camps, we fought back. There were all kinds of, of uprisings, all kinds of demonstrations. In Manzanar, a huge demonstration. Ten people were shot and killed. We fought back with stones and sticks. When you go up next to Japanese American internment, in the period leading up to that whole that period, was it. That was it. 
So basically he was just touching briefly on it, that there was like a mass demonstration in Manzanar, which was one of the camps and 10 people were killed. I mean, it's really like when we think about internment, folks were like literally policed with um, military, like they had guns on them all day and all night, 24 seven. And so I think it's a really incredible piece of history that we don't get that lost that like people didn't just go quietly. So we can go on to the next slide. So I'm going to talk a bit about the 1960s Asian American movement. I mean, like I said, resistance goes all the way back to railroad strikes and the incredible Chinese labor history, which is like a whole other class, which I really encourage you to learn more about if you're interested. Um, and we might do someday in the future as well. But we want to focus on the 1960s because it's really the birth of what we think about as like the modern Asian movement today and kind of where we're kind of the, 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 the shoulders that we're directly standing on. And so the 1960s Asian American movement movement was happening during a time which was the 60s and 70s when the entire world was getting free from colonialism. Like just to put into perspective, after World War I, about something like 95% of the globe was completely controlled by Europe. I mean, it was like only Ethiopia in, in Africa was not a colony. Um, outside of that, there was colonial struggles everywhere. Like it was Thailand, I think was one of the only countries in Asia, Thailand and Japan in Asia that were not colonized in one way, shape, or form post-World War I and going into World War II. And so not to bore you the a million tiny details, but after World War II, the Europeans were so devastated by the war that they, they lost their control over many of the people that were colonized. And, they, and there was this mass upswing where we saw most of Africa become liberated, Latin America. I mean, this was the time of like Asian liberation struggles in Asia. And so a lot of Asian Americans, as well as all people of color in America, were deeply inspired by this kind of activity, this expression of, uh, of nationalism and, and pride around the world and this, this expression of resistance. So we can go on to the next slide. So I want to start with a piece of history. Um, there's a, I'll get through a lot of history, but this is a little piece of history I wanted to start, kind of start with that people don't know about. I don't know if anyone, you can say in the chat, if you've ever heard of Cesar Chavez um, or anything related to his work, because one of the things that people don't talk about when they talk about Cesar Chavez is the fact that Larry Itilong, which was a, he was a Filipino worker, where they worked together as part of a lot of the work that they were doing. I mean, in 1965, Filipino farm workers, they were on strike against the Delano grape growers, which is a, it's a really incredible history when you get into it. They were demanding pay equal to the federal minimum wage. I mean, they were like demanding so much more than what the migrant workers had been making. And the strikes, I mean, they even went on strike and they attempted strikes. And really, it just was an incredible history to see. And, you know, the, the, the pushback from the companies was that they hired thugs, I mean, straight up to break up unions. They had all, all these fees tactics and they tried to pit workers of different races against each other but it wasn't working um, and so the Filipino farm workers reached out to the Mexican American groups with the United Farm Workers um, with the United Farm Workers which is the group the UFW and so they worked together in combination to really push forward their struggle and so I think it's really important like that we understand that like Asian Americans have always been part of the struggle in every way, shape, and form. And I don't have enough time to go into all the labor history, but I find this very important, especially for Filipino Americans, to learn more about because there's just so much legacy of struggle. So I want to move on to our next slide. So this one, I have a lot of stuff on. Um, I'm going to talk a lot, so y'all get ready. I am personally very excited about this like this particular group. How many people have heard of um, Irwakun? And also, I don't speak Cantonese. It's a Cantonese word, so I'm trying my best here. Um, Irwakun is a, an amazing group. If folks could just say if you've heard of them or never heard of them, I most people have I mean, never. Like, I learned about Irwakun when... I got schooled by a young lord. I felt so embarrassed. Like I was in New York City. I went to this like event and there was like a former Black Panther and a former young lord speaking. And I was like, oh my God, I'm like so inspired by the young lords. And he's like, he looks at me and he's like, do you know your own history? And I was like, wait, what do you mean? And he's like, do you know nothing about the Red Guards, about Irakun? Do you know nothing about the incredible struggle? He was going in. I was like, okay, sir, thank you. <laughs> like, and after that, that's when I was like, okay, like I gotta learn. And so Irakun was an 
organization. They were part of um, the, the Rainbow Coalition, which was run by the Black Panther Party. Um, the Black Panthers, for those of you who don't know about the Black Panther Party, the term Black Power, um, that's where it comes from. It really comes from this upswing in movements during this time period where the Black Panther Party fought against police brutality. They fought for the liberation of Black people in America. And there were socialist organization that today, you know, people have shirts that say Asada taught me, if you've ever seen them, or they do Asada chants. Asada Shakur was a, was a Black Panther. Huey Newton, Fred Hampton, if you've heard any of these names, like um, Judas and the Black Messiah that came out recently, that's Fred Hampton. He was a Black Panther. And the Panthers were, uh, you know, a vanguard organization. They really led the struggle in the movement, not just for Black people in America, but for all working people. And so Irakun and the Red Guard, they were the kind of Chinese and Chinese American, ultimately eventually Asian American version of the Black Panther Party. They joined the Rainbow Coalition with the Chicano movement, with the, with the national liberation struggles pretty much across the board with what was at the time, um, the, you know, the native resistance movement that was coming in to, 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 to um, American Indian movement, because that was the word I was looking for, the American Indian movement that was coming into its own. I mean, it was a really beautiful moment of solidarity, not just amongst people of color, but also poor white folks as well with the Young Patriots, um, which is a, there's a book I highly recommend, I'll put in later, about the Young Patriots and about that history. But this, this group, the Chinese American group that was part of the Rainbow Coalition, they are, we have so much as Asian Americans, we owe so much of our current conditions to the work that they did, and, and we don't even know about it. And so the name Irakun actually comes from the inspiration from the Boxer Rebellion in China. It stands for Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fists. And it really was like the Boxer Rebellion combined mysticisms and martial arts, and they organized the secret societies to oppose Western imperialism in China. And the youth that were in um, New York City at the time were very, very inspired by this as a term. And the group was made up of radical students, workers, and just working class youth. And it had both immigrants and American born Chinese to begin. And the Red Guards, which is the, um, the West Coast version of Irakun, they eventually became one. But the Red Guards, they were founded from a very working class background. The Red Guards formed a group. Um, they were, were formed from a group called Leeway, which stood for a legitimate way. It was formed in 1967 to unite and politicize street youth and gangs. So these were like the, like, these were like the street youth all coming together, trying to figure out how to better the community. And the most political among them, the people that were like, we really got to make change in our communities. We got to do something better. You know, those folks were the ones that went on to eventually form the Red Guards. And they formed the Red Guards because Leeway as an organization, you know, they ended up actually pooling money together and buying a pool hall and like hundreds of Asian youth would hang out there because they had nowhere else to be. This was before nonprofits. This was before any community centers existed. And so folks were just all up in the pool hall and almost every night, sometimes four times a night, the police would come in and raid and brutalize the youth. And so this was happening as a cycle months and months on end. And so in response, the, the, these youth decided to organize at a higher level. And they said, you know what, we need to do more. It can't just be, it can't just be like these programs that we're trying to run to help youth stay safe. We have to go above and beyond and, and think about the state and police in the system. And so these, gr these groups were very inspired by the movements happening in China at the time. And like, there's a, so much history to go into there, but I think it's so important that we mention it, that these groups, Asian Americans were very grounded in the revolutionary movements in China at this moment. And so as these groups merged together, um, I wanted to share a little bit about the history that they ended up doing in the 1970s. And when I said earlier that we like, oh, like Irakun so much, it's, I really mean it. Like here in New York City, like they did an extensive campaign to do door-to-door -door TB testing in Chinatown. And this was when TB was a huge problem in Chinatown because language access and millions of reasons, TB is considered like it's a disease of poverty. Like it's a disease, it's a disease of access and access to like proper hygiene. And beyond that, it's more than that. But that's a huge part of how TB spreads, close quarters with people who really don't have that kind of access. And there were no hospital facilities. There were no TB clinics and there was no hospital staff that spoke Chinese. And it was because of the work that they did door-to-door Door, which they were inspired. They joined in with Puerto Ricans as well as black organizers and working class white people in the Lower East Side to all fight together for the new governor hospital, which is still here you know, to this day, to, pro to, to force the city government to provide a TB x-ray and testing center that would have Chinese language access. And so that's a huge part of the story, like getting medical access and getting language access in hospitals. That's where it comes from. And in fact, if there's another really interesting piece of history about 
about the Young Lords, where to this day, at the Lincoln Hospital um, in Harlem, you can you can get um, acupuncture in your ear as a treatment for addiction. And those acupuncture classes, they were they were actually like they were widespread in the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, which is the Puerto Rican version of the Black Panther Party, and Irakun, because they had all visited China to learn the different tactics in China of how to care for people. And that's one of the medical things that they brought back and started spreading in the community. And so I think it's a really amazing history to think about how intertwined we all were together in the struggle. And so the last piece of part of it I will share before I move on is just that, you know, Irukun, they organized Asian Americans to resist the draft, which was a huge thing at this time. Draft resistance was a big part of the fight back against the war in Vietnam. And so they had specific centers to talk to, especially immigrant youth, about why they should be resisting the draft. They organized Chinese mothers and bilingual study groups and provided childcare school programs. So that way, you know, women could participate actively in study. They did tenants unions, low income housing, they supported Chinese businesses. I mean, they really did so much work. And um, eventually they expanded out and became an organization in 1972 that joined in with Japanese and Filipino organizations and became a whole, a bigger AAPI broader coalition rather than just Chinatown. And they were actually part of the fight of, of the National Coalition for Redress and Reparations, which was a national coalition that fought for Japanese reparations. And it's the reason actually why we actually got Japanese reparations today. And it's an incredible struggle. So the last piece I'll share is just that the way Irukun like um, ended up, you know, it, it never disappeared. It just changed, right? It, and eventually in 1978, they joined with Chicano organizers and formed the League of Revolutionary Struggle, which through the 80s distributed an all Chinese language newspaper called Getting together. Um, and so it's a really important history that we understand that this that the radical, this kind of radical legacy of the movement didn't disappear. It transformed. And then unfortunately, a lot of the energy got taken and pushed into the Jesse Jackson campaign of the 80s, which a lot of movements did. A lot of movements also got pushed into that as well. But like the idea that suddenly it stopped is not true. It continued. So we can move on. Awesome. So the anti-Vietnam War protests, um, I just wanted to show this image. You know, I, I had said this before and I really mean it, like Asian Americans at this time in the 60s really had a, an understanding that their, that our oppression is directly connected to the liberation struggles around the globe. And in fact, uh, another fun piece of history about the Liberation Front, um, there was an organization called the Third World Liberation Front. They were, and the, world, the word third world actually comes from the idea of that, you know, outside of the the U.S. and the Soviet Union, that there's a third path. Um, and that third path was a national liberation path. So that's a very long history. But people think third world is this negative derogatory term, and it's not. It actually comes from the legacy of struggle of liberation. And so the third world liberation struggle was mostly um, UC Berkeley students that all came together to like fight for like curriculum that was inclusive and fight for really just a, a much broader understanding of all oppressed people, all people of color uniting as one. But the word liberation Liberation Front comes from the People's Liberation Front in Vietnam. And the Gay Liberation Front, for anybody who knows anything about LGBTQ history, it was one of the first ever organizations um, that was founded after Stonewall. The Gay Liberation Front was responsible for so much of the politicization of young LGBTQ people during this time. And the Gay Liberation Front also came from the, the Vietnamese People's Liberation Army. And so I, I just want to underscore how much the movement was moved by Vietnam as a major touchstone and that the anti-Vietnamese sentiment in society, much like what we're seeing today where the anti-Asian hate crimes are really politicizing all of us, the anti-Vietnamese sentiment during this time politicized a whole generation of youth as well. And so if you want to see more of these photos, um, I'm going to write this in the chat. I didn't have time to bring up really amazing photos of it, but you can look up, up Ghidra. It was a newspaper um, that is a, a newspaper in the Japanese American community that has some incredible spreads of images of, of Asian Americans in the Vietnam War protests and all of the struggles around draft resistance, which Asian Americans led, because we really recognize that the struggle of, against US imperialism in Vietnam was our struggle at home right here, and that our, our liberation was intertwined. So we can go on to the next step or the next slide. <clears throat> 
So these are just some of the like 12 point platforms. Um, I won't read them all, but I just wanted to make it clear that um, what Irukun fought for and ultimately that was, Irukun was like the, like a leading, it was a leading organization in the Asian American movement at this time. They fought for the liberation of all oppressed people. Like the idea that Asian Americans organized in silos and did things just for our community is a complete lie. Like we have always been part and parcel of the struggle for all oppressed people. And the other part of it is that we, they, they were were a socialist organization. So they believe in the right to a job, the right to a home, the right to health care. This was their politics because they understood that imperialism and capitalism as a system are used and set up with the intention of oppressing our people and that we're only going to get free if we recognize a different way. And so they were also, like I said, very inspired by the movements in China. They were very inspired by the movements in Vietnam. And they really looked globally to, to get kind of language to understand our struggle. And so like, it's a really cool history. If you ever want to go deeper, just go ahead and check it out. So we can go on to the next piece. Awesome. So I want to mention these things briefly, um, and then I have an other photo to go into Peter Yu. But the political prisoners work, which we, we're going to go for our next class, we're going to do a class all on Black and Asian solidarity, which is going to go much deeper into this topic. But Yuri Kochiyama is like, an incredible leader for so many reasons, but one of the things people don't know about Yuri was that she was a, a leader in the fight to free political prisoners. And in fact, you know, one of the, the organizations that Yuri founded, and well, three of them, I mean, it was kind of crazy. There was a lot of like political prisoners organizing happening um, around like around the country. There was like a committee to free David Wong, who was a political prisoner in the sense that, you know, at this time, political prisoners weren't just people that were imprisoned because of protesting, which is a huge part of it, but they were also political prisoners that were people that were impoverished or put into people that were put into prison because they're poor or because they committed crimes of poverty. And so there was a few different committees that formed at this time to free um, different Asian political prisoners in New York City. And also to eventually one of the coalitions was called Asians for Mumia Abu Jamal. And so this this organization was like kind of Yuri Kochiyama's like brainchild. And eventually the Jericho movement, which is the movement today to free Mumia Abu Jamal, who's a very famous political prisoner. He was um, a former on the move. He was part of a, a black radical organization and he was framed. And it's, it's a whole history that I encourage you all to learn about Mumia Abu Jamal. But Yuri Kochiyama was one of the lead fighters in that struggle to free, you know, her comrade, her organizer, her fellow, her fellow freedom fighter, Mumia Abu Jamal. The other quick mention is that there was an organization called South Asians Against Police Brutality. South Asians had been, you know, organizing, especially in New York City, um, also the Taxi Workers Alliance back then as well. This was like the 80s and 90s, were organizing against police violence. Um, this was always a huge part of the struggle in South Asian communities as folks were coming to this country experiencing police violence. And so the organization to fight back was very significant. So we can move on to the next slide. This struggle, it's a very famous photo. It's what we actually use for our study group. Um, it's by the photographer Corky Lee, who we could talk about a whole nother time, but he was somebody I really encourage looking up. A lot of the, the photos we know of the Asian American movement from then were taken by Corky. But this is an image of a protest that happened in Chinatown. It was in 1975 when Peter Yu, um, he was a young Chinese American who was in New York City's Chinatown. He had asked the police stop beating a 15 year old who they were beating down for a traffic violation. And because he stopped and was concerned and tried to intervene, he was like savagely beaten. It was horrible. They stripped him. They beat him again. They arrested him on charges of resisting arrest and assaulting a police officer. It was disturbing what happened to Peter Yu. And so this action it was in response to that. And it was 15,000 people came out in Chinatown to take to the streets and fight back against police attacks and brutality against people in the Chinese community. And so, you know, there was a lot of demands around dismissing all the charges against you and end discrimination of the Chinese community in general. And also they expanded it out as well as an end to discrimination, employment, housing, education, health, and all other social services for all working people. And I think it's really important that like this struggle for Peter Yu, it was it's not just for Peter Yu, it was for literally all working class people who are facing the same type of brutality. And so I just wanted to mention this because it's super important that we understand that like police, like the fight back against police violence is part of our history. It's part of our blood. It's part of what we do. And so it's not something that's just coming into the fold. Asian people suddenly, you know, supporting Black Lives Matter or suddenly caring about police violence. Like it's happened in our communities, which is why we've organized around it. So we can move on to the next slide. <clears throat> 
I want to wrap as soon as I can. I'll say this quickly. Um, the garments worker strike in eight, 1982. This was in Chinatown. I just wanted to mention this is on Mott Street. This is in New York. 20,000 garment workers, almost entirely women. They marched down the center of Chinatown to Columbus Park on a warm spring day in 1982. And they had union hats. They raised picket signs. And they really were pushing to get the renewal of their union contract. And they were this united immigrant Chinese American coalition of women that were fighting for workers' rights that would really forever impact U.S. labor history. This is such an important piece of history that people don't talk about. Chinese people have been very significant in this country in the labor movement and all that they've done, you know, whether it's strikes on the railroads or it's the garment workers' strike, have always been significant um, movers and shakers and getting rights for workers. And we can see that today with the Fong Lee struggle. Um, it's one of the few unionized restaurants in Chinatown, and they're still fighting today to get their restaurant reopened. I know um, Kato is going to talk a little bit more about that. So we can move on to our next piece. I'll keep this brief. I'm really trying, y'all. I just, there's so much cool stuff. So the iHotel struggle, there's a whole documentary about it. You can look it up. Just look up iHotel struggle. The iHotel was, um, it was a lot. It was um, a lot to the community. It was truly, it was a political home. It was also more than a political home. It was like the last place for low-income low housing for poor and working um, Asian Americans, as well as Mexican Americans, Filipino Americans, Asian Americans broadly, I mean, Japanese Americans, you name it. Like, it was um, on the corner of what used to be old Manila town. This was in San Francisco. And so this is such an important kind of component of the work um, that was being done at this time because the I Hotel, um, it not only had low income housing units, but like I mentioned, it was also a political hub. Like Wei Min Shi, which is an organization, um, it's Mandarin for Organization of the People. It was an anti imperialist group that operated in the basement. They organized a center called the Asian Community Center. And they also had a bookstore for radical literature. And they used to do film showings, they used to do study groups, they used to do everything to politicize the Asian community in the I Hotel. And so they really, their focus at that time was about connecting imperialism abroad to our struggle here. And so what they did, they did a lot of draft resisting out of the I Hotel, like I had mentioned before. And so it's such an important history that we don't know about. But the other piece of history that's amazing about the, the defense of the I Hotel was that for a long time, um, San Francisco, the government had been trying to really like get rid of the I Hotel to gentrify the area further and to push out low income housing. And so I was Filipino, Japanese, Chinese, Mexican, Black, Latino, literally everybody, like white working people, all coming together um, in the middle of the night to form a chain that was six people deep. Like they had six different chains all back to back to back to back. And those chains all defended the hotel from having the police. They were trying to like ram in to evict the residents. And it was the community that stood outside, you know, like really thousands of people stood outside to make sure that people couldn't get in. It was an incredible struggle to fight against gentrification. And, you know, it was such an amazing struggle for like a variety of reasons, but the big one here is like the, the resilience and the connection to the community. It was like tens of thousands of people ultimately who across the, the Bay Area that stood together in defense of the I Hotel. So definitely check it out. I mean, ultimately the I Hotel was destroyed many years later, but it was a very long struggle. And Asian activists recall, you know, back in the day, the most important thing is that we have a, a, a hub, a center for our, our, our communities where we can talk about radical politics, where we can really talk and understand our oppression as Asian people in America. So we can move on to the next slide. Great, so I just wanted to, I'm not gonna talk on these. I'm just gonna, we can move on to the next one as well. These are just some names to know and to look into in the future. Yuri Kochiyama is one of them, anti-war activist, black liberation activist. We can move to the next one. Corky Lee, um, we, we can just skip through, Kata. We can just skip all the way through to your slides. But um, basically, Grace Lee Boggs, learn about her. She's amazing. She's like a Detroit activist who has been very deep in the Black liberation struggle for a very long time. Corky Lee, photographer, really well known. Um, there's just so many names. Fred Ho, who we missed earlier, 
Fred Ho actually wrote this book, which I'm gonna put in the chat for you all. It's called Legacy to Liberation. So much of this history lives in here. This is a, this is a collection of essays written by Asian activists in the 60s and 70s. You're not gonna find this, this information anywhere else. And I personally actually only learned about it because Fred Ho was briefly my mentor before he passed away. He gave me this book and it was a really incredible moment for me to learn a lot about this history was. So definitely buy it if you can um, and just read it. You can get it on Amazon if you want to get it quickly and easily. All right, I'm going to pass the baton over to wrap up. I just want to say, you know, thank you all for being here for this and to say that like our struggle as Asian people, it has always existed and it has always recognized that our struggle is international with our sisters, our brothers, our family abroad, and our struggle is directly connected to all of the other oppressed people in America and that we recognize that imperialism and US domination abroad is directly responsible for our oppression here. And so that has always been kind of the narrative of the movement. And the more you read, the more you'll learn. So thank you all for that. And Kara's going to talk a little bit about organizing today, and then we're going to do our breakout rooms. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. I have the, the mic now. Can everyone hear me? Okay, cool. So I um, just wanted to highlight some recent um, Asian organizing um, that, uh, you know, I have seen here in New York City. I want to highlight some of the um, the labor organizing. Rachel just talked about this. Um, something that's ongoing right now is the struggle to save Jing Fong, which is um, a very, very famous restaurant in Chinatown, um, iconic banquet hall. Um, families, you know, having wedding, weddings there, um, dim sum there. Um, it's an institution, community institution. And it's also the last unionized restaurant in Chinatown. Um, and this is an important, um, you know, worker struggle right now um, against the um, the landlord family. Um, and you know, we are continuing to support the struggle. Um, another struggle is the um, fight to keep public housing public. Um, there are a few Asian tenant unions across the city. Um, a, a few of them are associated with the organization CAV, which some of you might know. Um, but um, keeping public housing public, getting repairs for public housing. Um, and then um, on that corner there, we have um, the organization. Um, we're actually there as Answer Coalition as well. I'm joining them. This is Damayan. Um, they are a Filipino migrant worker organization um, fighting for um, you know, uh, fair wages, fighting for recognition, um, and um, you know, fighting for dignity for, um, for traffic workers. Um, and then also, um, you know, there is, there's still an anti-war movement, right? Um, Rachel mentioned the anti-war movement that really blossomed in the 60s and 70s and the anti-Vietnam War protests. Um, but today, you know, there are still, there are still protests because there are still occupations. Um, uh, on that corner, on the left corner there, um, this is, I think, I think that might be LA, um, but we, um, we joined Koreans um, in demanding that the U.S. leave um, the military bases in Korea right now. Um, it's a very strategic foothold for the U.S. and Asia. Um, that is an important struggle, again, that international solidarity. Um, and then that's, you know, very, very connected to police brutality. Um, and um, just recently this year, um, this was, this photo actually in Philly was taken a couple of weeks ago. Um, Justice for Christian Hall was a Chinese American teen, um, adopted teen um, from a multiracial fam family, family um, seeking mental health uh, help, but was shot by the cops. Um, and so these are just ongoing struggles right now, part of many, many struggles that um, are happening, you know, nationwide. Um, and then just wanted to offer, you know, right now we're seeing a lot of interest in uh, picking up the Asian American movement. There were very, very many registrants for this class. Um, you know, I can feel the energy of people today. Um, and we are at we are we're at an upswing, and we are also at this moment where I mean, this is you know we've already you know seen this and recognized this, but um, you know Asian people's liberation is intimately tied to um, you know the fate of all oppressed people, the collective liberation that we are seeking, um, and so it is um, uh, it is still ongoing. You know um, there um, you know we're plugged into so many different struggles, whether it's anti-war, whether it's housing, whether it's um, uh, the Black Liberation Movement, whether it's, um, you know, the environmental movement, um, all of these things are so connected and Asians are, um, you know, we are powerful and we are part of that, that struggle, that collective struggle. 
Um, cool. I think this is a good moment to go into the breakout rooms and reflect on, uh, you know, what we have seen, um, our, our legacy of resistance.